Good evening. Good evening. Um, welcome. Um, it, it is once again my privilege to introduce to you your minister, um, <laughs> <laughs> who you might recognise. Um, so, but but tonight Andrew is going to talk about um, university chaplaincy. I believe there's a clue up there. Um, uh, some of you will be aware um, that, well, some of you have been very generous at previous Lent lectures and made a donation, which has gone to uh, an organisation in some way related to the chaplaincy that we've been talking about. And if any of you want to give tonight, it is going to Young Homeless in Hertfordshire. Um, probably they wouldn't have the benefit of the Ministry of a, a University Chaplain or indeed the benefit of University Education, but it's young people who are in need. And so that's, that's yeah. what any, any donations for tonight will go. And I believe any that were given at the previous one that you did, Andrew, which was a fortnight ago. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to say anything else. Is that it? You. That's it. Well, that's a very nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm going to also mention the young homelessness charity when I next do my next su next Sunday morning service as, as well. Um, there are all sorts of connections and things, but it's an important charity and uh, we will be grateful for, for um, donations. Um, this is a very interesting thing for me because when I gave my last talk in this series, um, I talked about a form of chaplaincy that we were trying to invent rather than a form of chaplaincy that exists. And of course, this is probably one of the most, uh, university chaplaincy is probably one of the better known and more obvious forms of chaplaincy. It's been around a very, very long time. Um, and as a concept, it probably embraces, and, and I don't know whether this was the intention, but I think it's a really good one to end the series on, because it encapsulates most of what the other models of chaplaincy that you've heard about would include. And if you think about how chaplaincy is placing somebody or several somebodies outside the church and in another environment, that might be for pastoral reasons. Um, it might be to do with a particular institution or a particular time or state of life then this uh, chaplaincy tends to incorporate, incorporate a bit of everything. Um, you're not just there for the students, although traditionally, of course, uh, what people picture on the whole is a chaplain there talking to a group of nice holy-looking students who have come into the chaplaincy to find religious support. Uh, we are, of course, there also for the staff, um, and often, um, if you haven't spent any time in a university, uh, I can absolutely assure you that one of the most uh, dented and in need group of people that you will ever come across are teachers. And the teachers and professors, having spent their whole week trying to instill information into young people, often came to the chaplaincy saying, that's the last time I do that, I am resigning, I am walking out. Um, I do not get paid enough to deal with this lot of ne'er-do-well people who are driving me round the twist. So we had a role in terms of supporting um, the staff as well. In addition to that, uh, we also provide, as you would probably be aware, um, some of the formal functions within the university that we were there to undertake the work of the university, as we heard with um, the, uh, my, the, the previous speaker on airport chaplaincy, part of your job is to work with the structure of, in her case, uh, Luton Airport, and in my case, it was Birmingham University. And that meant attending things like graduations, um, being involved in uh, uh, problems where the university needed a team of people to look into issues. We were part of student services. 
And I will come back to all of this as we go through. And most of what I'm going to tell you tonight is extremely positive, and I hope it'll be a lot of fun. There is a serious part of this, and it is about the risk of chaplaincy, and I don't know how much, I think it's been covered a bit by each of our chaplains, but there is a risk in probably especially university chaplaincy, and it just comes down to that simple thing. You know how when people say you cannot serve to masters. Well, the problem with working in any chaplaincy environment is by the nature of reaching out into the community and also serving the church, you are, as a starter for 10, working for at least two employers, uh, the community that you're in and the thing. In a university, your employers are, well, the structure of the university. You have responsibilities to, in my case, the Methodist church. You also, of course, have responsibilities in terms of your Christian faith and belief. And you may, on top of that, find yourself belonging to other groups or organisations attached to the university who may or may not agree with whatever the university is up to. My starter story and anecdote for this dilemma that you can end up in is that one afternoon in the chaplaincy, there had been protests, and the protests were largely because news had got out that the vice-chancellor, and the vice-chancellor is the highest up, the chancellor is a figurehead. Isn't there not a, uh, the vice-chancellor is the person with power. And the vice-chancellor's pay uh, had been released in a local newspaper. Uh, his annual salary in 2000 and whenever it was, 15 or 16 or something like that, was 450,000 a year. At the same time, at the same time, student loans had been reduced. And needless to say, we in the chaplaincy found ourselves inundated with young protesting students, some of whom were members of our university, some who had come in from other universities to join in the protest. Um, and, and one of the first things that we noted, and myself and a guy called Sam Noakes, who was our, uh, the guy on the reception desk, and who was also our safeguarding officer, and the chap who was our direct link with the university. Now, you cannot understand, unless you've worked in a university, how important that one person is. Because to all intents and purposes, any connection through the university went through him. He, luckily, was a member of Selly Oak Methodist Church. In fact, my predecessor had done his wedding. Uh, I got to baptise his first child. So there was a certain incestuousness about the relationship. But it, suffice to say, Sam was sitting on the desk the day that the riots kicked off. The rioters were spraying things onto the side of the university. Sam went out, stuck in his role between being the chaplaincy uh, supporting the chaplaincy, who of course was supporting the students and therefore supporting the protest, placed his finger on the stuff and realised that it was spray chalk and not spray paint. He came back in and said, we need to teach these protesters how to protest. <laughs> What's the point in doing spray chalk? It's raining. Within a few hours of it kicking off, we had the Vice-Chancellor and his team who were going to break up the protests meeting in the chaplaincy because they thought it would be less noticeable than them meeting in, a build, in one of the buildings that were obviously theirs. What they didn't know, and what we forgot to mention them, to them, was that downstairs in the chaplaincy, we were making sandwiches for the protesters, that they were upstairs discussing whether or not they were going to break them up and by what means. You can easily find yourself in a position where the vice-chancellor is saying one thing to you, 
and you're having to quietly say something else to another group of people. So before I start properly, where I'm going to begin and end is with the problem that is serving many masters. And because it does have a serious context, is that if we put people out into the community and ask them to support or be involved in a school or an airport, you will, it doesn't matter what you do, you have put them in a place of risk. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have placed them in a community in which they may not have control and also where those people will be, the, the, the various bosses that you have, may not get on with each other and may have conflicting instructions for what you're going to be doing. That's the serious aspect of, 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 of chaplaincy for me and something that I'll come back to in a minute. However, not everything that we did was terribly serious. I'm hoping that I've been indoctrinated into the loyal order of the clicker. I'm, oh, lovely. Okay, let's start with some nice stories of university. This is my first year at Birmingham University as a chaplain. The lady standing on stilts at the back is called Cat. Um, Cat. Um, and Matt, that's not Matt, that's Tom. Tom you may know. Some of you will have met Tom because he married Jess. And Jess now preaches here occasionally and Tom comes and with the baby and, and so on. But anyway, this was a few years ago. Um, we uh, joined up Methsoc, the Methodist Society, um, at the university. Oh, I should have said this at the start. I am wearing my actual Methsoc Sweatshirt. I'm going to come over and show you. I mean, the word chaplain is worn off. But it does have Met Socks label on the, on the side there. Okay. So um, this was in the, the first year, and uh, we wanted to help the students to get to know one another. So one of the things that we, we did... Um, sorry, what, have I done it wrong? Stand still. I, I'll stand still, sorry. Um, the, the, uh, this was the circus sock. Cirque sock. We were meth sock and we met up with Cirque sock. Cat is learning how to walk on stilts. I don't think Tom was helping her. He was usually up to something that would probably cause chaos. It was an important part of our job to try and broaden the minds of the students. It's, it's, it's very difficult to explain to what extent because I can't demonstrate it, but let's just say that when you are in this environment, the Methodist students are very Methodist, the Catholic students are very Catholic, the humanists are very humanist, and part of our job as chaplains was to try and get them all out of their boxes and to stop behaving like they, that the whole world existed only in the Methodist Church. Joining them up with Cirque Sock was a really good idea because it turns out that not everybody in Cirque Sock was a Methodist. So, sorry? Yes, 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 I'm going to do a, I'm, I need to look though and see if it's worked. There we go. Now to be fair, oh, did it go too? Okay, well I'll talk about that one and then we'll go backwards when it goes back. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, this is Tom and uh, Naomi. Um, and this was uh, an event that we set up, which was a treasure hunt around Birmingham University. Um, and the winners received a mixture of gifts, including daffodils and chocolate bunnies. Um, Naomi is the uh, lady uh, behind the flowers. Naomi is uh, now a doctor. Um, and uh, writes important papers for the uh, BMA about um, end-of-life care. Um, she's an extremely intelligent person. She's also a concert cellist. Now, this was one of the other problems about university life, okay? 
I was surrounded by people, and as some of you will know also, um, Tom is a qualified psychiatrist now. I was surrounded by incredibly intelligent people. Um, I'll just click on to the next one. Um, we, every year, on as many occasions as possible, joined up all the Christian societies together. The man in the hat in the middle is the Catholic priest, Father Patrick, who is absolutely lovely and thinks that he lives in Agatha Christie land. You can see that from his parents. Not everybody who is a student is a young person. Some of the people in that picture who are grown-ups are also students, and some of the ones that look like they ought to be students are in fact members of staff. Boundaries at university can get very complicated, and one of the things you learn very quickly is not to make an assumption. Doctor, professor, somebody that's turned up in your office could well be a postgraduate student and not one of the lecturers. But they might do a bit of lecturing on the side, which they do or do not get paid for according to where they fit into the system. But it was very important to us to bring the students together for special events. And we all used to meet up at a fantastic facility called Newman House, which was a accommodation block, and this is perhaps one of the more serious aspects to the work, was that um, students who turned up at the university didn't always cope. And one of the things that Newman House offered was alternative accommodation for students who perhaps found living in ordinary student blocks too difficult. It was quieter, it was more reflective, there was also always a Catholic nun and a priest on hand, and when necessary, you could call in a Methodist chaplain or someone else to give support. This was in the grounds of Newman House. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and every year, because we brought everybody together, we would have a firework display around the time of November the 5th. I have to say that the most dangerous event I ever went to in my life was the firework display at Newman House. Every year, the Catholic students would bulk by a huge number of fireworks and then place them at various intervals around the grounds and on cue would set them off. At the time, we had also got, staying very near to us, um, an Indian student who had uh, come from one of the wealthiest areas in India, uh, somewhere, in, um, somewhere not too far from Bangalore. And um, she came over and she was learning about what it was like to be a student. One of the first things we took her to was the Catholic firework night. The fireworks went in any direction except for upwards. At one point, a firework went straight past the crowd and hit the wooden shed that contained the uh, straw and hay that was kept for a number of the students' rabbits. The shed went up in flames and was completely destroyed. Most of the students ran into the building as the, as the shed was hit. Fireworks were flying round our feet. We dived into the building and I suddenly spotted that the Indian student uh, was standing out in the grounds still watching the fireworks. I ran out to re re rescue her and she said, this is fantastic, it's just like Diwali at home. Um, so, yes, the, 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 the Catholic fireworks were, were, were quite, um, quite an event. But we would try and bring the students together to learn about all the different faith groups and to meet up with various people. Um, this is the Central Mosque in Birmingham, and this is a photograph that was taken for a display at the university. Um, and we took photographs of various faith groups around the city. Um, and we were trying to introduce the students to a, a variety of ranges of faiths and perspectives. Now, one of the key things that, that, that bringing people together in a university provides is not only the opportunity to 
see join in with uh, another faith group, which is, let's be honest, it's not easy when you live... I mean, I don't know if anyone here has at any point visited the mosque in Hemel Hempstead, but the, the, you, you have one or two... Have, yeah. But on the whole, it's harder when you're in the community to cross over those boundaries. But in a university... It's the natural thing. You're there to learn and to broaden your horizons. That, that by the way, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but you see the moon is right by the minaret. Okay. It took an age to get that photo because the traffic wouldn't stop. And in order to get that photo, I had to lay in the middle of a set of traffic lights um, and take the photo slightly upwards to get the moon coming past the minaret. But the, 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 the students got to, to meet up with these different faith groups, and it was part of our job to get them to learn of the other faith. The crossovers were really interesting. Uh, if we ran an alpha course, you would often find people of other faiths coming to learn about Christianity as part of the alpha course. Um, when the Sikh society did Bangra night, there was a... Do, do you know Bangra? Kind of, yeah, the light bulb music um, uh, of course it was a, it was, there was a lovely opportunity for people to dance and dance together and so a lot of our Christian students would join the Bangra night but the best thing the best thing of all was the food because every week during the year some group was having a festival Langar, Eid, uh, you name it. Uh, I was trying to think of what the Christian ones were. They always seem to involve cream teas. Sometimes the students' enthusiasm ran away with them. The Sikh students, every year, did the Festival of Langar. And in the Festival of Langar, the, the intention is that you feed everybody. So on the campus, there was roughly seven to 8,000 people maximum. The whole university was about 31,000 people, but some of those were in Dubai or in Tibet, and some of them were distance learning, and, you know, so on average, you'd have about seven or 8,000 people. They would set up a tent in the middle of the campus and serve vegetarian curry and these huge dessert sweets big orange pretzels made of sugar. They were absolutely glorious. And everybody on campus would queue up to get their free food. It was all free. You get your free food and your great big sugary sweet and you would be fed and you would be shown what the Sikh faith was. You had to wear, a, you had to cover your head um, and take your shoes off. But that was the only cost to you was you did that and then you came out with your wonderful food. In a university, depending on how many people and how many groups you have, the Christian Union is usually represents most of the Christians on the campus. Birmingham University was a bit different. 83% of the university declared to be religious. 40% of the university declared as Christian. The result of which was there was an Angsoc, a Methsoc, a Christian Union, a Baptist society, the Indian Orthodox Church, the Romanian Orthodox Church. There was the Pentecostal Choir, the Pentecostal Society. Um, and these are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. There were lots of different Christian societies. In that environment you have the blessing of diversity. You have the curse of extremism. The university had to have strict rules about what was and wasn't allowed. And one of the things that was allowed was that you were allowed to be for anything. You may support anything you want to support. You could not have a group that was against somebody else. We are the pro-Palestinian society, is fine. We are the anti-Israel society, was not. Do you see how it is a simple rule of, rule of thumb? 
Because there were so many Christian societies, extreme Christian folk had targeted the Christian Union in an attempt to keep traditional Christian values on campus. This meant that every so often we had a battle on our hands because there would be undercover agents on the campus who looked like students but who weren't. And they would be speaking out against other faiths and other groups or they might, uh, they might be deliberately trying to frighten people into joining the Christian Union. This would include lots of leaflets saying that you were going to hell if you'd done any of a list of different things. One of our jobs as chaplains working for the institution was to eradicate problems. Uh, and there were rules that we had to make sure were applied. And this is where I start saying serving two masters can be difficult. The Christian Union, on the whole, were not a problem. But these extremists that were coming in were. The extremists forced through a policy that meant that the Christian Union didn't allow female leadership. This is in 2012 to 2016. They did not allow Christian leadership. Uh, they didn't allow female leadership. And the university did not allow groups that excluded women. So we had to go into the group and basically say, sort yourselves out or you will no longer be one of the Christian societies accepted by the university. If we set up a carol service, and it was one of the biggest things of the year, was the, method, was the uh, um, university chaplaincy carol service, immediately the Christian Union would set up an alternative carol service in the same building for a couple of hours earlier and claim that that was the chaplaincy carol service. So you can imagine it, was, it, could, be an interesting, it could be an interesting setup. Um, I'll see if I can get another picture. I mean, it doesn't matter if they don't. Oh, 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 it went past. There we go. Oh, it went straight back. Okay, thank you if you rescued me. Well done. Love. Let's not kid ourselves. Not everybody went to university with the intention of coming out with a degree. Even the ones that wanted to come out with a degree often wanted to come out with something else in, as well. I'd like you to meet uh, Perry and Catherine, uh, who I got to do their wedding. <coughs> um, lovely couple. Uh, rather disturbingly, they discovered each other not through the chaplaincy, but through the country and Western society at the university. You will notice that on their wedding day, they were dressed in cowboy boots and cowboy hats, um, they, were, they, were, they were a lovely couple. But it, I use this picture just to illustrate that, that if, if we find ourselves in a pickle with some of the organisational aspects, it's worth remembering that one of the enormous joys was that between any arguments we might have with universities and structures was that we got to do stuff like this. We got to meet the future partners of, to encourage people in their relationships and their journeys, to support. Um, I was also the LGBTQ chaplain for Birmingham University. Um, and I'm sure I've told many of you this story, but I will just say it just for, I think it's relevant, that I had been to so many LGBTQ events and believe me, one of the most moving things that happened every year was the Holocaust Memorial event because it affected both the Jewish students and the LGBTQ students and they would join together uh, in the centre of the campus and light candles uh, for all of those who had been persecuted or lost their lives um, as part of the um, Holocaust. And the Holocaust Memorial was one of the most moving things we had uh, Hasidic Jews in full Orthodox costume standing next to tattooed, pierced, blue-haired characters, and it was just, uh, just the most uh, beautiful thing. Anyway, I'd been the chaplain for so long that, and every Wednesday we'd have a coffee morning um, where we'd all sit round with the LGBTQ students and basically give them an opportunity to say we're being got at or we're being persecuted. 
And one day I was sitting there and I realised that the chap next to me was referring to my partner in the assumption that I was also gay. And I felt that since he'd been so open with me, and so everybody in the group had been so open with me, that it was time that I outed myself. And I stood up and said at the meeting, you've all been so generous and so open. I think it's really important that I am open with you. I need to tell you that I'm straight, I'm married, and I have two children. And the chap next to me put his hand on my shoulder and he said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> so, so, part of our, so part of our job was to, um, I don't know if it will go on to, would you put it on to the next one for me? Um, This is another one in the series of different faiths. Uh, We went on an adventure around the city and we found various different um, uh, faith things in the city. And this was just a whole bunch of uh, crosses um, in a gate. And we couldn't see why, what it was attached to. Because if you look, I know it's all done arty, but if you look behind, it's all tower blocks. But all the fences on this tower blocks had Christian crosses all in the thing. And we, we, we don't know why, it was just a lovely thing. If I can have the next slide, please, I think it might be helpful. Okay. So the other thing was we tried to engage the students with um, things that were happening around the city, um, especially if they were related to faith. This was the uh, Love Your Neighbour campaign that was being held in Birmingham City Centre. Um, And this whole project, I I presume you heard about it, but the idea was that uh, we were uh, bringing to faiths together and we were saying to everybody in the community, the main premise of all of our faiths is the same, which is to love your neighbour as ourselves. Uh, the, The Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, all of them hold basically that same principle. That, that we love our neighbours as ourselves. So it was all brought together. Um, the bishop, the gentleman with the white hair, slightly snuck in. Um, we don't know that he was directly involved in the campaign, but trying to get a photo that day without the bishop in it was the most incredibly difficult thing. He appeared in every shot that we took. But you'll also see, and, and this is very important, um, about three in from the right, or might be four in from the right, or well, three in from the right is me. You see me holding up my, my thing. Don't look too closely, I'm holding it upside down. It's not terribly important, but I, my message was upside down. Next to me and to my right was my boss. And she was the head of student services. Her name is Nahid Saeed. Saeed. Um, she is currently helping me organize my son's wedding. Um, she is absolutely wonderful and she and I were working together at the chaplaincy and we said we need the chaplaincy to work for a broader group of people we need a slogan and all she said was why don't we just say it's for all faiths and none and we started producing all this literature about all faiths and none and we started a bicycle scheme together where we offered to recycle students bicycles that had been dumped on the campus and we would mend them and then we'd give them out for free to other students. This is the most evangelical thing that I have ever done in my life because we gave out hundreds and hundreds of bicycles and almost everybody that got a free bicycle said, why are you doing this? What is this building and, um, and what's a chaplain? And we'd have to explain, well, as a group of Christians, we've put together this bicycle scheme and we're doing these things together. And they would say, well, that's amazing. And is this to do with your faith? And we'd end up having these bizarre faith conversations whilst mending a bicycle. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting how people would talk to us about things that they wouldn't ever talk about anywhere else. But if you were there with a bicycle pump and a tyre and, and covered in oil they come and talk to you about faith quite happily. I realise that I I want to open up to questions in a minute. Um, Next slide, if that's all right, if I may have the next one. Um, Yes. Birmingham is not all beautiful. Birmingham has some very, very rough areas, um, but it's also got so many people in it who are um, willing to 
help, support, care. Um, un under some of this Arabic symbol here, it simply says, uh, every, I'll, I'll read, I'll try and read, every day of your life is a page of your history. Every day of your life is a page of your history. That is on the wall in a housing estate behind a derelict garage and a scrapyard. And, you know, you turn around a corner and you get this profound moment. So another thing we used to do with the students was walk the canals and go on graffiti tours of Birmingham. Because so often people were expressing their faith and their religion and, and what they felt about the world on the wall. Um, and it was just a fabulous way, again, of talking to people um, about... Just as a little aside, there wasn't... On the whole, I'm not easily shocked, OK? We had some students that came to the university um, who were given special grants because they were in war zones, or their families were in war zones, and they would be given an opportunity to come and study, but obviously they needed money and they needed a place of safety. So at the university, um, it was one of mine and the chaplain's jobs to introduce them to living in Britain. They would all take their grants, we'd take them for a walk, we'd show them around the city, we'd tell them where they could buy food, we'd do all that basic stuff, and then they'd all disappear into the Apple store and come out with expensive phones. We were walking with a group of students from the Ivory Coast, and as we were walking along, they started asking various questions about living in Britain. The classic question was, why do we keep all these animals that we don't eat? And we said, well, we have pets and all the rest of it. They said, but, but look, all the way down the canal, there are swans and there are geese, but nobody's eating them. And I said, well, and I thought I was so smug. Well, I said, to be honest, I mean, they're not that easy to catch. This chap that I was walking with, who was six foot seven tall, reached up his hand and caught a squirrel, literally like that. And he said, can you eat these? <laughs> we learned something about not making assumptions. I've never seen anyone's hands move. Since. He was used to catching animals and eating them. Well, why wouldn't you eat a squirrel, you know? It's just a bit of fur. Anyway, um, that was a bit, bit of a surprise. I've lost track of where I was going with that. Anyway, that was part of our job was to encourage them. Can I have the next, the next slide? Okay. So to start drawing this to a close, um, the, the, the most important thing, obviously, uh, for us was to sit with, eat, and be in fellowship with as many of the students that we possibly could. This is a typical MethSoc gathering. Um, we got... Uh, grants from the circuit to pay for food um, and uh, we took them to some quite nice restaurants that that particular one um, I think is just the uh, pub lunch it was the first thing we do with them when the students arrived we would uh, when they came and signed up to join Methsoc on the Sunday we'd bring them all to church in the minibus and then give them Sunday lunch at the local pub um, and it would become such a thing that, that, that they would then eventually organise the trips to the pub themselves and invite us to come and join them, which was, which was really lovely. Um, the lady three down, uh, the, 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 the first lady on the left here, Hannah, uh, she is a very, very highly qualified bell ringer and, and is, has taken part in international bell ringing societies. Uh, the next lady is a doctor. Um, Alison, there, you'll see her at the Connectional Conference. Um, she's part of the Connectional team now. Um, and uh, Anne, at the end there, Anne was, was, was a very interesting character who, who was a postgraduate. Uh, I don't know, what, what's, a, what's the next thing after a mature student? Um, a, very, a very mature student. <laughs> Who? Anne, oh, I can't, do you know, I can't, off the top, of, I'll try and remember afterwards, yeah. Ah, well, yes, um, 
the lady at that end I did the wedding for, um, uh, the lady in closest on that side is a physicist. Uh, they were a bright bunch of people anyway. Um, next slide. Um, during, during Freshers' Week, we would try and feed all the students something. Anyone that came to the chaplaincy, uh, the chaplaincy's footfall was about 1,800 students a week, probably about double that during Freshers' Week. Um, that is the materials to make sandwiches uh, for all the students and cake, uh, and people would bring cake. What I can absolutely assure you is that everything fitted into that car behind me, but only just. Uh, and we literally, uh, we literally had loaves of bread covering the windows. Um, so that was that. Uh, we joined up with the um, Gilbert and Sullivan Society and did shows. We joined up with the Drama Society and did Shakespeare. We'd work with as many different groups as was, was possible. Um, uh, uh, the, lady on the, the lady on the left is a lawyer now. Um, and has offered me her services if any of you ever have a go at me. And, and the lady on the right is currently a conservative politician working in Surrey. So um, that was just a couple more examples of our crazy Methodist group that we had. We had a lot of theological debates and discussions. Part of my job was to have theological things. Uh, we tried to keep it fun. Uh, that just says, okay, everyone, now listen carefully. I don't want to end up with four different versions of this. Thank you. You may laugh at this point. And um, if we have the next slide, have we got another one? Yes. And the end of all of this was where perhaps all of our intentions came together. The university liked the chaplaincy because it stopped people from leaving the university, staff and students. We got to encourage students all the way through their journey and the culmination of which was that we got to attend the graduations of all the students. And so this was the last bit. That was Naomi that you met at the beginning of our slide journey as she graduated as a medical doctor um, a few years ago. And that was me trying to look like I was intelligent and understood what she was talking about. So I'll draw this to a close by saying that's, that was a kind of a round trip through university chaplaincy. Uh, it was a joy, a pleasure, a challenge. But the issue that I mentioned at the start is actually what got me fired in the end was that different bodies within the university and the church didn't agree. And it resulted in there being gaps and holes and somebody was able to get me fired. And, and I only hold that up as being, it is one of the risks of all chaplains is that you are at the behest of the institution in which you are a guest. And so it was a wonderful journey for five years, but at the end of my five years, it became extremely difficult and very political because these groups of people didn't see eye to eye. The Methodist Church had an expectation of what the work was that we were doing. The university had an expectation of the work that we were doing. My boss, Nahid, had a different expectation of what was happening. And ultimately, we had to agree that I was no longer the person for the job. So anyway, many happy days, wonderful time. I'm happy to open it up for questions if, um, if my, uh, my lovely assistant... <laughs> I, we, I can do glamour. I was trying to be... I do glamour, but I can't. I was trying to be politically correct. Oh, sorry, and I should have mentioned that Father Ted was, 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 came to the university from Jill, who you've, some of you have met, because the Anglican chap chaplain, just to prove it wasn't just me, the poor Anglican chaplain got fired as well, but she got fired before me. And when she got fired, we needed an interregnum. So this, the, we, we purchased this bear, Jill purchased this bear, and it sat in the on Anglican office with a bottle of wine in its paw for many months before the new chaplain came. And he was originally known as Father Francis because the chaplaincy was Francis Hall. And... He's now Father Ted, um, but he's still the same bear. Sorry, yes, thank you for listening. <coughs> thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, Caroline spoke to us about the prison chaplaincy, mm. and last week we heard about the, railway, the, the airport chaplaincy. 
One of the big differences from those two institutions in the same way that the university, in my mind, is an institution. It is, definitely. The, is that they are multi-faith chaplaincies, yes. whereas you seem to have only been talking, uh, you've talked about the other societies, mm. but is the chaplaincy multi-faith or yeah. is it Christian? Yeah, the chaplaincy was all faiths and none, and it was definitely a multi, and I was expected, and this was one of the clashes of interests, was that um, the church expectation was that I would find students and bring them to the church. The university's expectation was that I would look after people of different faiths, and, do, and I, to them I was a multi-faith chaplain. To the Methodist church, I was a Methodist chaplain. To some of the Christian chaplains, they assumed that I was a Christian chaplain and not a multi-faith chaplain. So sometimes there were these, these things. So, for example, one of the clashes that, you know, so that you've got the specifics, really, um, one of the clash issues was... If you were an orthodox something, and you know, whichever faith it was, uh, you might struggle with the fact that I was also an LGBTQ chaplain. So you would have an expectation from the university that I would be multi-faith and all genders and all people, but that the Christian groups or societies might come along and say, you can't be a Christian chaplain because you're looking after this group um so sometimes we go through an exercise deliberately in order to bring everybody together we had um multi-faith lgbtq discussions uh, we also brought the university together to vote for same-sex marriage in the university and got all the faiths to sign off on it because most of them had the grace to say we don't want to do them but we're happy if you do. But the difficulty then was that there were vociferous groups who said, oh, no, we're not. But, yes, yeah, so it was a multi-faith multi chaplaincy. Um, one of our issues was it was very hard to get chaplains from the Islamic community because uh, they don't have a tradition of chaplaincy. So getting a paid chaplain to be an equal to all the other chaplains was very, very difficult. You could get a part-time chaplain, you could get somebody to come in one day a week from some faith societies, but getting someone as a full-time paid chaplain wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't all faiths that felt that that was a real thing. So yes, we, we sometimes had to act slightly spuriously as being, um, yes, hello, I'm a Muslim chaplain today. I was going to say, if the Muslim chaplain isn't in that day. No. Uh, that somebody was looking for someone, you would still yeah. be able to, to work with them to a degree. Yes, and, and what we and would do... And expected to. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and what we would do is, is, for instance, Nahid and I would work together to make sure that that was covered. Because um, it could be, yes, it could be sometimes quite... Some of the things we were asked to do were quite difficult and very complicated, and I... <coughs> That might come up in the questions. Anyway, sorry. Yes, anyone else? Oh, right. Picking up what you said, what were the difficult and complicated things you had to do? Um, yeah. um, one of the hardest aspects is that um, students um, arriving at the university and living on their own for the first time the, uh, the rate of attempted suicides, uh, mental health is a, a disaster area, and the chaplaincy was part of the me mental health team. Um, I was involved in, and I, uh, please forgive me, this is quite a difficult topic, so I'm, I, I really don't know how to broach it, but uh, I worked with a lot of students who were anorexic, and we worked with the local hospital ward and we had a student who uh, had come to the chaplaincy, we'd helped for a bit, student services were involved. They were moved to a hospital, mental health hospital wing, and they managed to commit suicide on the hospital wing, under observation. Um, I was phoned up at two o'clock in the morning by Nahid to say that this had happened, and she phoned in the early hours of the morning because the, her, the girl's brother 
was on a placement from the university in Sri Lanka and they hadn't been able to get through to him. So between Nahid and I, we worked out how to contact the brother and get him transport back to come to the university and to, 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 to be there. And obviously we worked with the, um, uh, we worked with the, um, uh, uh, the student services and so on to help. I would like to say, having, uh, uh, that was a horrific experience, but human beings are absolutely amazing. You know all that stuff that you hear where everybody says, oh, you're not allowed to do this in that church and you're not allowed to, you know, and, and, and anyone who commits suicide is, is out and all this sort of stuff. Um, the, the young lady was connected to Cathsock and uh, she want, the, the, the family had asked whether she could have a funeral at, what's the very high Catholic, what, what, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, it begins with a W, it's got the shrine, the big, Walsingham, thank you, thank you. Um, the family had asked whether she could have a funeral at Walsingham, and a few people had already said, Catholic, you can't, you can't have a, somebody who's committed suicide. So we phoned up the priest at Walsingham, and he just said, get everyone down here, we'll just do it. He said, he said I, I don't care what the cause of death is, We'll get everybody down. And, and we filled um, the minibus with all these students, and they were all um, they were all the friends that had been on the same ward or had knew I mean, and we took them all to the Catholic Church. It was an incredible service, and not one person said anything about it being you know, that it was a problem or that she was gay or that she'd committed suicide. And, you know, human beings are incredible. Um, sorry. <laughs> I didn't think that one would still get to me. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, yeah, so um, there were some things that were a bit... Um, that were a little bit difficult. Thank you. <laughs> I said, oh, no, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty, um, pretty dramatic event. Yeah, we all drove back in the minibus, and one of the upsides was, was of course, uh, it was a long journey back, and so we all piled into a pub halfway along the, the, the road, and um, one of the students decided that we needed to sing hymns in the pub, so we all sat in a pub singing hymns, which, um, which is very interesting. <laughs> I was, I was the one sitting there going, I'm not very comfortable with this. <laughs> Why are we singing hymns in a pub? You know. <laughs> Um, I was just going to ask if you had any contact with, like, the local parish, because when I was at uni, um, they were just opening a new joint Anglican Methodist chaplaincy, and that had come about because they'd actually knocked down the two local churches. Right. Um, so they catered for the whole, you know, area, the congregations of yeah. the whole area. And we had a very good relationship with the Catholics because yeah. the, my first year there was no chaplaincy at, so we lodged with the Catholics, which was a, yeah. And I've yeah, very much so. I mean, certainly, particularly the Catholics and the Methodists worked together hand in hand. We both had accommodation blocks, and there was a Methodist accommodation block called a Astley House, um, and there was Newman House, um, and we'd work together in the community and so on. Um, but also the Methodist circuit was heavily involved, and every year the Methodist circuit would produce cakes for Freshers' Week. And I think we peaked out at 107 cakes, and then we would get the students would take them door to door and deliver cake to the newcomers to the, to the, to the university. But yes, we worked with all sorts of places. Um, in that particular area the bishop was not particularly ecumenical, which made working with the Anglican parish a bit awkward. But that wasn't the Anglican's fault, that was the bishop's fault. Um, actually, on campus, we all, worked, we all worked very well together and, you know. But yes, there was certainly Catholics and Anglicans, it was a very strong bond. Um, we felt it was our job to offer accommodation to anyone that couldn't find it and things like that. Sorry, I'm waffling on now.
Any more? Any more for any more? You silenced them. I know, I'm sorry I got all emotional there for a minute. That was but yeah, a, but yeah. it is, isn't it? Especially when you're dealing with the raw emotions yes. of people who feel they've not got a future. And yeah, absolutely. But yeah. also, what a wonderful gift that people responded in the way that they did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's amazing, isn't it? But that does happen. <laughs> yes, and I, and I think it's not often lauded. I think a lot of people feel that it can't be... Because it has to happen quietly, you, it doesn't get broadcast to say what a fantastic job Walsingham did and that they broke all the rules to get things done because, of course, Walsingham are not going to put it out on the internet and say, hey, look what we did, because they keep it quiet and we all go back and we all promise not to make a big fuss about it. And so, of course, these wonderful acts of humanity don't get don't get heard about but um, we often we'd often find that that, that 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 people would just step beyond you know if if the need was there if there was a problem it didn't matter whether you were buddhist catholic muslim or of no faith you know there was always somebody willing to step up and join in um Perhaps just an amusing thing to cheer us up a little bit after my slightly fraught tale. Um, we had a, an event one night where we brought together the Humanist Society and the Methsoc to have debate night. Um, debate night collapsed into board game night, but before it did, uh, we did manage to have a debate on whether or not we believed in Father Christmas and whether we should teach our children about Father Christmas. I would like to say that the humanists all defended the right of the children to have freedom of belief and believe in Father Christmas, and it was the blooming Methodists who decided that we shouldn't lie to our kids and we shouldn't teach them about Father Christmas. So, you know... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was just, but it was just one of those things where I'm thinking, I'm arguing with the humanists tonight. What are the Methodists doing, you know? But yes, they were, they were arguing that we shouldn't teach children about Father Christmas. And I was like, oh. That and the tooth fairy is always a bit of a problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think it's probably time yes. that we wound this up. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Um, I've also had the privilege, and well, I don't know whether it is a privilege really, of being a university chaplain, and it's really good to hear your, your experiences. Um, mine were in a very, very different context, and um, I'm not at all sure that anything that I contributed was fruitful really, but it's really good to hear how fruitful yours has been mm -hmm. in many ways, despite its ending. Um, and so, Actually, first, I'm going to ask people to show their appreciation, and then I will pray. Shall we do it that <laughs> way around? So. Thank you. We're really grateful to you for, for all of that. And so, let's pray. Loving God, we hold before you the work of the university chaplains of different faiths and different denominations, conscious of some of the difficulties that they face, but also of the huge goodwill that there is. We hold before you the staff, the stresses, all of the difficulties that come with supporting students in that context and the students themselves, particularly those who really don't know how to cope with being away from home for the first time or having freedom for the first time and not necessarily going in a direction that is healthy or safe. We pray that your work will continue to be done in your way by all the people there. And that that will be a true 
sign, not only of your presence, but of your love and your inclusion of all of those people. And so we simply place all of those thoughts in your care and thank you for the time that we have spent together and all of the things that we've heard and the people who have shared with us. Bless us as we go in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Excuse me, great gate crashing for a moment, but I want to thank all of the people that have made this series possible. Obviously, I've written to each of the chaplains apart from Andrew and thanked them for their contributions after the sessions. But we have had the stewards being greeters and making teas and coffee. We've had Bob most weeks, but at least a caretaker opening up the building for us and technicians, not just the three here today, but a team of technicians have helped out throughout. And it really has been a joy to have, have coordinated doing this series of talks. I hope that the Church Council will agree for us to do a season six of our Lent lectures um, next year. Our theme is still, because I think there is still a need for it, is still, I believe, what is on your heart? What is it that you feel strongly about? You don't have to come up here and stand and talk about it. If you've got something that's on your heart, there's usually an organization that we can invite somebody to come and talk on your behalf. So please say if there is something that you'd like to know more about or you think, I'm coping with this and people don't understand. I've sort of in the back of my mind got something based on maybe health issues next time. We've not covered that specifically. I don't know. Tell me if there's something on your heart that we can include in a future series. But thank you all for supporting it, not just from HHMC either. So it's really good to, to have been able to welcome you and to get to know you over the last few weeks. Thank you all. <laughs>